Giuliano Menini successfully convinced a jury that Amanda Knox masterminded the slaying of her former British roommate during a drug-fueled sex game. Knox's murder conviction was a personal victory for the powerful prosecutor. But now, a judge in Florence has convicted Menini of abuse of power in a previous case. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clementi, former New York City prosecutor and retired FBI profiler. I'm also the writer and producer on CBS's Criminal Minds. And with me today is... Laura Richards, advocate, analyst, and activist, and founder and director of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service, and also co-creator and producer of the case of Jean Benet Ramsey. And I'm Skyping in live into the LA studio to talk about the case of Mer Meredith Kircher because I've been working in London over the last few weeks. So it's great to be here. And I'm Lisa Zambetti. I'm the casting director for Criminal Minds, where Jim Clementi is my colleague. I have a real interest in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. And with us today is a very special guest and colleague of mine. Steve Moore. I'm a retired FBI agent also, and uh, I uh, haven't worked with Jim before except, uh, except just recently, and uh, ex except one case in the FBI, I believe. Right. I think... Uh, when I was in the behavioral analysis unit, uh, you uh, requested I, some assistance from our unit. I had a case where there was a gentleman who was uh, uh, extorting uh, a company, uh, said he was going to blow up the uh, a refinery out in California. And uh, you sent me back a profile, and I remember the, uh, the verbiage on it. It said, you ring the bell, you've got the most dangerous guy for this fiscal year so far. Oh, Great. wow. That's... Well, Gary. well, the thing about it is, yeah, I, I obviously knew of you. I had never met you while we were actually working in the FBI. It wasn't until we actually retired and we found ourselves uh, both interested in the Amanda Knox uh, situation uh, in the Meredith Kircher murder. And um, I looked at, I remember when I first started looking at it, obviously it was the things that were published, um, the yeah, crime scene yeah. video. Right. And I remember you asked me, um, if I wouldn't mind, since I had the experience, not only being trained as a chemist, but also uh, the experience of being on the evidence response team for the FBI for eight and a half years, if I would look at the crime scene videos and determine what, if any, uh, things were done right or wrong. And, and, and I had a I lot of confidence in that because after all the years in the Bureau, I, I, I could see what was what was wrong with this, I thought. And uh, the one thing about this case, the murder of Meredith Kircher, is that I could bring it to any law enforcement person I trusted and not be afraid of their honest opinion because I knew what it would be, mm -hmm. that, this was, uh, that this was a travesty. And that's why I wasn't afraid to get Jim involved because I knew that he was reasonable, fair, and would come to the right conclusion, which was inescapable. Towards that end, you know, we're having you on today for a reason. We've been covering the Meredith Kircher murder, and we've gone deep dives into all aspects of her murder, including her real killer and uh, interviews that he's done on Italian TV. And really what's left to cover is kind of her second assailant, really, uh, yeah. the person who really did a lot of harm to her and did not bring her justice that she deserved. And that is, Jim? The prosecutor, McNini. McNini, yeah. yes. And I know you have some stories to tell about him. And we're, we're all concerned about, and if you've listened to our podcast before, what we try to do, um, especially with Laura's background, is, is speak from the victim's perspective. We like to give the voice back to the victim of the crime because, unfortunately, that voice was taken away from them in a violent way. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it'd be helpful, Steve, if you can just explain also how you got involved with Meredith's case. So I think, you know, we've all had a different sort of locus around it. And as Jim quite rightly said, you know, a lot of the work I do is the victim's voice and making sure victims aren't forgotten or made footnotes in their own murders. But I know right. you got involved in a, 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 a quite an interesting way. Well, can you I, tell yeah. us a bit about that? I had just retired from the Bureau. You know, that whole thing where uh, we commit... Uh, we commit professional alchemy. We take the professional experience and turn it into gold. And I had gotten my retirement job at a university that had six overseas campuses 
uh, in some nice garden spots, including Florence, Italy. And my responsibility was to make sure our students overseas were safe. And so I followed cases like the Knox case. And one morning at 1 a.m., my wife had been up, could not sleep, watched a documentary on the Knox case and uh, said, by the way, Steve, I need to ask you about this Amanda Knox thing because I think she might be innocent, not guilty. And I said, well, when did you start believing the press instead of the prosecutors? And she said, well, there's just a lot of questions I have about it. And I said in my FBI voice, I said, uh, I will prove to you just on the evidence they have that she's guilty. Hmm. And after three months of trying to do that, I came to the uh, frightening conclusion that not only was she not guilty, she couldn't have committed the crime and that there was uh, some pretty horrible reasons that she was put up to this. Right. And I think that that is a similar way that I approached it as well. Um, Having just watched all the newspaper, newspaper coverage and the media coverage of the case, it looked like from everything that was coming out that that Amanda Knox and Raffaele Celestito, um, along with Rudy Guede, all conspired together to kill this poor girl. And it looked horrific. But mm-hmm. that was only because that's how the news coverage was. And I know, Steve, that, that you've had this experience as well as I have, that we've been involved in cases when we work for the FBI where mm-hmm. there's plenty of news coverage. And, and we're actually at the epicenter of the investigation. Yeah. Yet we read the news coverage and we realize they found out little tiny facts here and there. What and then they, they weave together a completely <laughs> different story right. for the newspapers. And then people read that in print and they believe it. They think yep. that's actually what's going on. Right. And we're in a position where we can't speak out about it. Right. We can't correct the media because... This is a confidential investigation. We can neither confirm nor deny. Right. And how about you, Laura? When you were involved in cases in the UK, didn't didn't the same kind of thing happen? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, the media obviously will go to print what they find out. And in this particular case, of course, there was a direct feed from the prosecutor to one of the mail, the Daily Mail journalists. But I think, you know, certainly the way that we always approach it, and in fact, even looking at this particular case, you know, I approached it very much from just understanding the facts and the evidence without looking at all at the potential suspects. And, you know, as I mentioned before, from even talking, you know, about this case, most people, when you mention Meredith Kircher's name, no matter where you are in the world, um, they don't really locate the case. They don't remember it. But when you mention Amanda Knox's name, people do. And, you know, that's the real frustration, I think, even now. And I can, you know, know for Steve's point of view, it's just incredibly frustrating. Um, And we're trying to obviously um, make sure that the narrative is a correct one. But it was flawed right from the start. And, you know, I do think that there was a number of people who played a key role in that. And, of course, we're going to talk a a lot more about Mignini. And, you know, I think there's a lot of information we should probably cover before he even worked on this case. Steve, you mentioned Nick Pisa. Yes. Uh, you know him directly, yes. don't you? Nick was, when I was working um, in in Perugia on her, on Amanda's uh, um, appeal, Nick was assigned to me by RAI Network as my um, interpreter for any of their interviews. So this is the guy, just for our listeners to refresh your memories, this is the reporter from the Daily Mail uh, from London, who happened to speak Italian, who McNini kind of invited in to his own, to his offices and used as a way to leak information, uh, most of it very incendiary information, right. and in the end, most of it absolutely false. And Nick was also the uh, journalist, I'm, I'm led to believe, that uh, coined the term Foxy Noxy. Really? So he was not Amanda's friend early on, and he and I had um, long discussions about that whole process. Really? Well, he should have been her friend because she made him very famous and made him a lot of money. It's not about being friends, though, is it? This is about people doing their jobs and reporting on the facts. And he he didn't do that. He reported on facts that he was given by one individual in particular, but he didn't fact check and didn't corroborate anything. Right. Was that your understanding, Steve, from, from early on? Well, he, he told me he didn't. 
um, I asked him why he didn't uh, verify anything he was told. And his response was that that wasn't his job. He was there to report what he was told and what he <laughs> saw. And he, I think the way he put it was, I am not the, uh, I'm not the truth verifier for this prosecutor. I'm reporting what he tells me. Yeah, but that's the point. That's what journalists are supposed to do. It is what journalists are supposed to do. So clearly, I mean, he's a hypocrite calling himself a journalist. What he is is a mouthpiece for a prosecutor who was out of control. And we'll get into that in a little bit. And by the way, he told me at the time, and this is just days before uh, Amanda Knox's exoneration, he told me that he was completely convinced that Amanda was innocent, yet he still continued to write these stories for uh, the British tabloids. And what they did, what, what those stories did, was they basically got the people who read them fired you know, up. all fired up, all riled up, all incensed that Amanda Knox was getting away with murder. Rightly fact, so, based on the information they were provided. Well, if that information had been accurate, but we exactly. have to, we have to exactly. put in some air quotes or inverted commas here because the fact is they weren't facts. They were statements made by a prosecutor who was trying to direct the evidence in a trial they that were lies. clearly were erroneous. They were lies. He okay. knew that. I mean, Jim, I saw the, as you did, the uh, tape of the crime scene. The collection. Uh, on a, I'm sorry? Yeah, the crime scene collection of yes, evidence. Yes, it was unedited. And the day, after, the day that they arrested Amanda Knox, this prosecutor, Manini, held above his head a receipt and said, this is the receipt Amanda um, got when she purchased bleach to clean the crime scene. Three days earlier, he had seen a crime scene that looked like a slaughterhouse. I'm sorry. I, I know it's yeah, horrible. It's horrible. Nobody had tried to clean anything. And so for him to stand up there with the receipt was not a misstatement. It was not an error. It was an intentional misstatement of fact. And there's a word for that. Yeah. And whatever happened to that, quote, receipt? It disappeared. It was never entered in trial, which is interesting because you and I both know if you have good evidence, you're going to put it into trial. Right. So it's another indicator of Never the misleading information that McNini was providing to this, well, would-be journalist who was obviously just a mouthpiece for him and to the world. It, In America, you're not, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't, like, tell the press of the, of the evidence that you have ahead of the trial. No, I you mean, wouldn't. that would be... Well, no, but what, what other case do we see that happen in? Making a murderer, right? Yeah. That... In that case, the prosecutor did exactly the same thing. Because he actually had no case, he made his case to the public, right. poisoning the jury pool and forever creating a situation in which that defendant could never get a fair trial. Beware when the prosecutor speaks to the press and not the jury. But the lead so, investigator and the prosecutor seem to think that... Um, the physical evidence didn't matter, though. I mean, that was the other side to it. The, you know, they were saying we knew that she was guilty without the physical evidence. Human lie detectors. I, I wish we had some of those in America. Well, here's the thing. We don't have human lie detectors here, but we do have people who are actually trained in criminal behavior. We have actually, Laura and I, have actually studied this. Laura, from a psychological perspective and a behavioral analysis perspective, and me from a criminal investigator and behavioral analysis per perspective. And we have learned after doing thousands and thousands of cases, what criminal behavior pre and post offense behavior actually is and how it's exhibited and what it can mean. But we also are smart enough not to just base it on behavioral evidence. We look at all the evidence available and the forensic evidence yeah, is critically important if you have it. And if you don't have it, that also tells you something. And in this case, although McNini, the lead prosecutor, and the investigators immediately were suspicious of Amanda and Raffaele, instead of going where the evidence took them, they tried to push evidence. And we talked about this at length in our last couple of episodes about McNini's interview of Rudy Guede. And today, we'll also get into how that quote, interview or interrogation of Rudy Guede differs dramatically from the interrogation 
of Amanda Knox. And I want to get into what that gut feel, these gut feelings that these Italian police officers, police women and Menini had. You know, why did they fasten on her the way they did? And I, I want you to talk about that, Steve, because I know you know a lot about that. Okay, guys, just hold that thought. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll continue our discussion. Hello, it's Jim Clementi and Francie Hakes with a special message about a new show that I'm hosting on Wondery called Locked Up Abroad. In each episode, people tell their harrowing stories of being convicted of crimes and jailed in foreign lands or kidnapped and held hostage in war-torn countries. These are definitely worst-case, worst-case scenarios. They're truly frightening situations. Yes. No best cases here. But it is fascinating to hear how they manage to survive these ordeals. In the first episode, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes tells us about being imprisoned in Turkey for smuggling hashish. Oliver Stone even made a movie about it. But that was the movie. This is the real story. I haven't had the chance to interview Billy Hayes recently, and he told me the whole story behind the story of how he escaped a Turkish prison. He even told me that he went back to Turkey years later. You have to hear his story to believe it. And now, in his own words, here is Billy Hayes. Knox's stepfather says it's the first good news they've had in a long time. They show that, that he's willing to break the law in order to, do, uh, uh, or to, to pursue his ideas. I think that's very serious when you consider the fact that he's one that's supposed to be upholding the law. And we're back. Uh, let's pick up where we left off. Before the last thing I wanted to get into, just before, um, before we get into the meat of this discussion, is you talked about the job that you had, and Steve, and the fact that as a part of that job, you felt it was your responsibility to find out about this particular case because right. you had students from your university, hundred miles from where, where Amanda was, right in the same country. So obviously, things that happened to. Meredith Kircher, another visiting student in Italy, could also affect students that you were supposed to be protecting. Absolutely. Uh, and um, that didn't go well. I know you can't talk about the details of that, but I can at least tell the listeners that Steve was actually prevented. He was told not to work on this case after first being told he could work on this case as part of his job. But it was a very contentious situation there and he ended up having to leave um, that job which was a great job and which he deserved um, but it was unfortunate because he did it because he wanted to protect justice he wanted to fight for justice for Meredith Kircher and make sure that there weren't any false convictions in a case that was across the ocean and that I I think that's one thing that people fail to realize is that when it appears that we might be trying to get a, a, a guilty person out of prison, uh, they 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 see us differently than what our real motivation is. Let's find the real killer because every cell occupied by an innocent person means that there is a killer on the street. Yeah, and that's what it's all about. And in fact, and we've talked a little bit about this in our past episodes, in fact, Rudy Guede is ostensibly out of prison at this point. I mean, he can go out on day trips. He's done three day trips. He can go out and take classes if he wants. And basically, he's going to be released on parole very shortly. But Amanda Knox, they wanted life. They fought for life in prison for. It's it literally. Can you talk a little bit, Laura, about how the justice system, whether it's in the United States or the UK or obviously here in Italy, treats women differently than male offenders. Certainly when we compared this case as well with um, the Nicole and Ron Goldman case and OJ Simpson, you know, if we put it on those that level in particular, I think everyone wanted OJ Simpson not to be guilty. Um, and given his status and everything else that went with that versus Amanda Knox in this situation where it seemed that everybody wanted her to be. And I think, you know, I remember Nick Pisa in particular saying in the documentary um, when he was questioned about the evidence and he was questioned about um, Guede in particular, he said, well, we weren't really interested in him. The only person we were interested in was Amanda. 
And you've got to ask yourself, you know, why is that? And I think in this case, in, first off, with Amanda Knox, it was about the way that she looked and the way that she presented. And there were things that, um, because she was and is, you know, a, a beautiful to look at, there seemed to be a laser focus on her and her behaviour um, right from the start. And in particular, her interaction with Raffaele Selecito. And some of those things that when Jim and I looked at it um, in the way that they were interacting, there weren't, weren't, weren't things that were off at all, but Mignini and others had made up their mind about her. But in the, the wider scheme of things, we certainly see with domestic violence cases, for example, in the UK and the Law Commission looked at this in particular, that when battered women kill their abusive partner, they tend to get a far longer sentence when convicted. And, you know, again, it seems to be this kind of epistemic imbalance about the way that women are treated and the way that men are treated. And I think it, with, with Italy as well, you know, the, the mis, misogynistic element here, um, and I think Mignini, you know, is a huge misogynist, but is that more about the culture and the patriarchy um, within Italy and you know I certainly wouldn't say it's just about Italy it's about other countries too about how we treat women and men and the inequalities and sexism um, that abounds too and some of it is not noticed but I think this case in particular really does bring into sharp relief how Amanda was really um, I would call it persecuted rather than you know this it wasn't about prosecution it was about persecution it and if you would, if if somebody wanted to allow, and hypothetically that that uh, the Italian or some Latin countries tend to have a more uh, male focused culture, Menini was beyond the norm in his country, uh, and I I talked to several uh, national police carabinieri officers, and they were embarrassed by him, and. Um, he was viewed kind of like we would view in America a deep South prosecutor uh, who was going after people of color. They didn't appreciate him and didn't respect him. And that was um, that worked to my favor at least once. Right. Well, and we'll go get into that. But don't you feel, though, that that the general public and I think Pisa and other illegitimate journalists took advantage of this, as well as the prosecutors and investigators in this case, that they're drawn to the dichotomy of a beautiful young woman and a violent murder. And that, to me, is what they wanted to see. That's they wanted to create out of whole cloth because, to them, it was more sensational. Just the fact that they were trying to draw this conclusion that somebody who looked as nice and as young and as beautiful innocent, as Amanda very Knox, innocent. Yes, yeah. could actually be capable of hiding a tremendous dark side. And to me, that's what Mignini wants. He wants the show, the emotion, the, the grandstanding that that brings him. And in fact, I think it, in my personal opinion, it helped him get beyond his own conviction, the mm -hmm. fact that he was convicted of abuse of office he was um, sentenced to 16 months. He was sentenced to 16 months, but they did reverse it yeah. on a technicality, and he was supposed to be retried. But well, they reversed it on a technicality because he had friends in the right places. Yeah. It had nothing to do with uh, justice. We really. should get back to we didn't even get the lead in on why he was uh, right. and that, of abuse. That all, that all stems from the case of the monster of Florence. And so why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Steve? The Monster of Florence in, in or Il Mostro de Florence uh, is a um, is a case where there was a series of s serial murders of uh, couples over the course of uh, many, many years. It was uh, somewhat similar to the uh, Son of Sam killings in New York. Or the Colonial Parkway murders that we've covered earlier this year. Yeah, yeah but the Monster of Florence cases, though, were much more similar in terms of victimology and situationally to the Son of Sam, David Berkowitz killer where where we profiled this case mm -hmm. in, in my unit and uh roger depew did that didn't he? yeah and the difference between what the actual behavior shows in this case and what mcnini made out of this case is just astronomical he turned it into ritualistic murders and yes. and basically the mm -hmm. fact is that when you have a killer like 
and and the behavior that's exhibited at the crime scene and and the pre and post offense behavior that we can uh, glean from it. When you have a killer like that, it is very sexually motivated. It has to do with that own person's psychology, not with some devil or worshiping or anything like like that. It was although there are ritualistic aspects to it, they're not ritualistic in terms of the uh, Satan worshiping, which is what McNini tried to make it into. Well, he made about three cases in a row. He he alleged satanic sex games gone wrong. Really? It's yeah. his go-to thing. That was his best pitch. Yeah, he yeah. would he would throw that with full count every time. So, yeah, he, he believed that. He, he actually believed that demons walked the earth uh, in physical form. He is a very... Well, maybe he is one of well, them. Well, he could be right, <laughs> uh, but he, he, he didn't understand who they were. Yeah. Um, Apparently, he didn't have a mirror. <laughs> and Well, he wouldn't have appeared. So <laughs> that was a joke. Anyway, um, when, when he got involved in the Monster of Florence case, obviously it was in Firenze, it was in Florence, he became involved in the Monster of Florence case, I believe through some type of Italian version of our task force uh, situations. And he went down there and his method of investigation was absolutely abhorrent to ev- to the, uh, the Florentines. He was uh, putting people in jail on no cause. He was threatening journalists. He threatened a friend of mine, in fact, uh, Doug Preston, a, a New York Times bestseller, who was writing a book on that. Um, Didn't he also threaten you? I, well, in a way, he, uh, he, I don't think when I was over there he wanted to mess with an FBI agent. Right, uh, but didn't he, like, he indict detained... you from afar at some point? The, the, well, nobody will tell me if I've been indicted. Oh, okay. Uh, I wrote a book later on with Doug Preston and a judge and some DNA experts. And I was and John Douglas right? and John Douglas. And I was told that I probably shouldn't return to Italy because there was probably a uh, super secret indictment against me for Calunia, uh, for their version of libel, even though uh, def- uh, truth should be a defense. It should be. Well, yeah, we've covered your book, um, The Forgotten Killer, The Forgotten right? Killer. Yeah. And and, you know, we appreciate you having written that with the rest of those experts, because it really laid out in a very simple, straightforward way exactly what happened in the case and exactly what happened with McNini. Well, thank you. Yeah, and the, the other thing to say is that um, didn't he also um, have Mario Spezzi arrested? Yeah. Um, he yeah. was the other journalist, and, you know, he had followed the case, hadn't he, right from the start, and he was held for 23 days, um, and five of those were without a lawyer. Mm-hmm. And he also accused, as you said, your uh, Douglas Preston of being a criminal and also being into Satan and said that he would indict him unless he ceased his investigative reporting. It was Mario who told me not to come to Italy. So I, I, I believe him. Yeah. Well, I, I believe him. He's gone now. Yes. Uh, so we should clarify that those two were writing a book about mm-hmm. Il Mostro and... Giuliano Manini brought them both in, uh, Preston and Spezzi, and interrogated them uh, for several hours and in what Doug Preston called a terrifying interrogation. Now, Doug has been all over the world doing criminal, criminal uh, investigation, criminal journalism, and for him to say it was terrifying means something to me. Yes, and he was an adult at the time. Oh, yeah. A married adult with a family and... With friends in Italy. He had been around the world over and over again. So he was an experienced adult. With good lawyers behind him. And this is a very good time and a good segue to the actual interrogation of Guede versus Knox. And when we come back, we'll talk about that. Menini's conviction is related to an unsolved serial murder case that goes back to the 70s and 80s. Seven couples were killed in the Tuscan Hills, and the killer, dubbed the Monster of Florence, was never caught. So I think it's probably important to say just the history with Mignini um, was that in 2008, um, he was charged with the illegal wiretaps and threatening people, including Douglas Preston, the journalist. And he, he was charged with malfeasance in a public office, which, you know, again, 
is really fascinating when you think about his behaviour and then his behaviour, not just in that case, but then the second time round, um, which, as you mentioned, Jim C., you know, the fact that he's trying to misdirect things so much, he probably sees this as his, the, the, the Kircher case, as his chance to rehabilitate his professional standing. Um, so he does have a self-serving agenda. And certainly having other people um, arrested, people like Mario Spezzi, the journalist, and held for 23 days, um, and accusing um, the other journalist, Douglas Preston, of being a criminal and a satanist and threatening an indictment unless he ceases his investigative reporting and left Italy really gives us a flavour of, of who he was. And actually, in 2006, he was charged with the abuse of, um, abuse of office for ordering the illegal wiretaps. And that was of police officers and journalists. And the sequence was then in 2010, he was found guilty and received a six-month suspended sentence. But Mignini appealed the conviction, but was able, whilst he was appealing it, to remain in office. And that's when he picked up the, or got involved with the Meredith Kircher case. And it was in November 2011 that the Court of Appeal in Florence overturned the conviction and referred it to a prosecutor in Turin to decide whether to refile the charges. Right. But I yeah. think it's really fascinating that you know, he doesn't get removed as a prosecutor. I mean, I, I can't think of anywhere else where, you know, that would happen. Because yeah, clearly you... there's a trust and confidence issue here, isn't there? There's a um, corruption issue. That's what we would call it. Right. There would be no confidence in the, in the uh, integrity of that, whatever prosecution he went after. And, and in fact, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> right. There shouldn't have been. It, what was funny about it in a macabre type of way was that um, during uh, the tr the appeal of Amanda Knox, he was a convicted felon. So was she. She was appealing her conviction. And there are strict rules against felons communicating with felons. And so... <laughs> Which he, of course, violated. Uh, of course he violated them. But uh, it, was, it was kind of ironic sitting in court watching a felon... Uh, interrogating a felon on the stand. Yeah, that's just. Crazy. Where's the accountability? I mean, you know, people do want to know that officials, those who are within the criminal justice system, abide by the law, that they're the gatekeeper of, and that they're not corrupt or using it for their own ends. And it just seems, you know, to be complete double standards and, and very ironic. You know, what sort of justice system is it with these double standards? And the Italians have a specific problem with that because during the uh, big mob trials in the. Uh, uh, 80s, I believe it was in the early 80s. The in order to protect the judges and the prosecutors from the mob, they were given really unprecedented power, and so Menini used this. You know, it, wherever there's power, there's going to be abuse, and the more power they gave these prosecutors, the more responsibility they obviously had. Menini just felt that he had a blank check. Right, and it, it was very obvious, um, it, even in the in the Netflix documentary about this case where Bignini just his ego just oozed all over that that documentary but especially you know in the end where he basically wipes his hands of any responsibility <laughs> I know he he did he did mention something in the middle of that or towards the end of that documentary um, he mentioned that somebody came up to him and called him evil, I believe. Evil, yes. A, a beautiful woman, I think. Really? Yes. Uh, Why don't uh, you tell us about that? Well, it's a woman I met uh, about 20 years ago and married. Um, she. Um, That's his wife, Michelle, is what he's trying yes. to say. Michelle, the same one who got me involved in this case. Um, she and I were, I was there for the appeal. She wanted to come along, and during a break in one of the court proceedings, she had had enough of of his um he had he had done something very tactless and horrible in the courtroom he played a gynecologically correct video of the victim in the in the way in the manner she was found in the crime scene on a loop what? while he spoke about 10 minutes and this was i know something that the Kircher family did not want, did not authorize. It was so disturbing for me, and I've been to 50 autopsies or more. Um, I walked out of the courtroom because I didn't need to see it. Um, and my wife um, stayed in the courtroom because she had something to say to Menini. And uh, 
And what it, did she say? Well, she said, uh, you are evil and you have no soul, which apparently in Italy is a crime. And he had her, uh, he had a bunch of carabinieri uh, go to her, uh, detain her and take her passport, which terrified me because you can hold somebody in Italy for 364 days without charges. Well, which is what he did to Amanda and Amanda. Raffaele. So this is the same guy who won't test a semen stain, but he has no problem putting this victim on display. That's I, right. I, that's in disgusting. That is, that is disgusting. He is, and, and with every, with every re-loop of the thing, it went into sharper focus. Uh, and why? What was he, what was he it pointing was, out? It was the standard thing of of incensing the jury one causing the jury to demand revenge on the nearest person they could find same thing with the knife that he took from Raffaele's <laughs> uh, apartment he he, cl he clearly had them collect the only knife that was big and scary and you know, something that he could wave in front of the jury, even though it had absolutely nothing to do with the crime. And Jim, you remember from that crime scene video, I'm sure, they opened a drawer and there were probably seven, eight knives in there. Yes. And the investigator picked up one and walked away with it. If you were at the crime scene and found that one of the investigators had picked up only one knife out of a drawer... Would you have come out of your Tyvex and strangled them? Well, I wouldn't. I hopefully I wouldn't have actually killed them, but <laughs> um, but what I would have done was fired them immediately yeah. and started the search over. And I what mean, are the chances that that one knife they got would be the one? Well, where it's so ridiculous. It's absurd. It's insane. It's and it is clearly them looking for something to wave in front of a jury that right. looked menacing, even though the actual wounds that were caused to Meredith Kircher were done by a very narrow short blade and had nothing to do with that kitchen knife. This, the knife they selected could not have fit in the wounds. That was their own investigator, own expert who said that. Right. Can we walk this back to when he first arrived at the crime scene, uh, you know, where Mer Meredith Kircher was found? And it seems like his background, according to the Nina Burley book, just primed him to see this as a satanic ritual. I mean, he has a very superstitious background. And as you've said, he's he's seen this in crime scenes before. And when right. he arrived there, there were just all kinds of little signs and symbols that he to took. Him. To him. that he yeah. took very literally and... Uh, do you want to talk about that, Steve, or do you know? It's it's hard for me to to put into words kind of the uh, the thoughts of a man who's so disordered on 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 these types of things. There was nothing in that crime scene. It was a, it just the crime scene itself was a disordered crime scene. Nobody had made any attempt to hide their identity, and he came in and concluded that what was obviously a single person murder. Uh, was a group thing, and uh, to to come up with a conclusion that Amanda killed her roommate because she wouldn't consent to sex with a stranger is absolutely stunning. It's completely made up out of whole cloth. There is absolutely no evidence to support that, and and that is exactly the opposite of what an actual investigation is. You take your time, you collect the evidence, you interpret the evidence that you have. You don't create a theory, an absurdity, and then try to fit evidence into it. I mean, it's very similar to in the Monster of Florence case, where during the search of one of the suspects, one, and I'm again, mm -hmm. those are inverted commas around that, that term suspect, he found a a, a rock that was being used as a as a doorstop in the house. I think it might have been in Speezy's house. I'm not <laughs> sure. And he said this is the same kind of rock that is used in satanic rituals, this kind of stone, and there were stones similar to this around some of the crime scenes, so this is a satanic ritualistic it's like set of murders. like saying that Satanists drive to some of their crimes in Fords. Therefore, if you have a Ford, you're a Satanist. Right, there you go. And and why do you think why Amanda when when you look at when he arrives there why not Philomena ah, you know what but I mean she they... is she, one she is there 
Two, she is kissing her boyfriend. But, Wait, yes, three, uh, she's not from Italy. She's an outside monster. Go ahead. Well, you know who I think is the luckiest person in Italy? That's going to be Filomena Romanelli. And I know, Jim, you and I have talked about this before, but I feel like there, by the grace of God, goes that woman. Because right. if he had turned his jaundiced eye to her... Right. And, so, you know, because she had the same alibi as Amanda, or she was with her boyfriend, not very far away, 20 minutes away. She did not go out of town like the other roommates. She came back to the crime scene with her boyfriend, just like Amanda. She brought a lawyer with her before she even knew there was, you know, uh, that Meredith was dead. I mean, you could easily turn it around and see her as a potential assailant you know it was that maybe she made her room look like somebody broke into it to throw suspicion off of her i mean it's a fantasy and there is no way i in a million years believe it but But if you're but if you're him he he could easily have no difference between that fantasy that you just created and the fantasy that mcnini created to build a case against amanda knock we have so much more to talk about with steve so tune in next week when we'll have part two of our conversation with retired fbi agent steve moore So if you enjoy our podcast and would like to support us, there are a couple of important things you can do. First, you can go over to iTunes and give us a positive five-star review. You can check out our sponsors and take advantage of the special promotions for Real Crime Profile listeners. You can go over and like our Facebook page and you can follow us on Twitter. But most importantly, you can share our podcast with friends, family and anyone you know would be interested in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. So thank you for listening. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineered by Terrell Parham. Music composed by Simba Zumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go on the website www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Helpline free phone 0800 2000 247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, safety, shelter or counselling, call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, 214-946-4357 or go on their website, www.genesisshelter.org or the domestic violence hotline on 800-799-7233. If you're a regular listener to the show, you know we have great brands like Blue Apron, Audible, and Casper advertising with us, and they keep coming back because our listeners really respond to them, which we're really thankful for. Well, if you happen to own a business or manage the advertising buy for one, then you should consider advertising on Real Crime Profile. Podcast advertising is on the rise, and it's one of the most effective ways of reaching consumers on the go today. So please Please go to Wondery.com slash advertisers. Again, it's Wondery.com slash advertisers and get in touch with us. Thanks. Thanks.